So good morning. Uh, today uh, we will continue with uh, security issues. Uh, today we will start with a new topic: uh, terrorism and terror financing. So here uh, we are going to uh, see the issues in defining terrorism and different types of terrorism, especially what type of terrorism we face in India and uh, how the terror is being financed and what are the methods used um, and the measures against it. Uh, one of the major uh, terror financing method is money laundering. So that we will see as a separate topic because that's a important one and it is also in current affairs for a long time. So that we will discuss it in the next class in a larger perspective, okay? Fine. So we'll go into the topic. So as far as the previous year questions are concerned, uh, we have some questions with respect to terrorism. One, discuss the strategies to be adopted to counter the environment, that is the radicalism, what it is happening in the multi-religious and multi-ethnic society, what we are. And then the scourge of terrorism is a grave challenge to national security. And what solutions you can provide and major sources of terror funding. Terrorism is emerging as a competitive industry over the last, last few decades, analyzed about statement. So how it becomes a competitive industry, so competitive industry here, they try to mention how they could uh, thrive out. So here you need to uh, mention about transnational uh, organized crime. Okay, that we will, so the question relates to terrorism. We are going to deal it with uh, related to terrorism and border uh, after completing a border management. So in that way, we will be discussing here and you will be having some inputs from this part also. So I have included this in this session also. Okay. So uh, these are some questions which are there related to this topic uh, in the previous uh, year between 2013 to 2020, right? 2021. Fine. So first uh, we will go with the definition of terrorism. So generally uh, the one of the global problem what we had uh, in this respect uh, is the definition of terrorism. Definition of terrorism is one important issue because none of the international law have defined terrorism. Okay, so this is one of the major disputes and there are disputes in defining terrorism, what constitutes terror, okay? So India has elaborated this definition of this uh, terrorism because India is affected with the different types of terrorism. Uh, and uh, uh, to be frank, uh, IPC, which is uh, followed even today, this code does not have uh, terrorism as an offense, okay? Even in the uh, subsequent amendments, we were not uh, uh, including that um, as a part of uh, Indian Penal Code. Rather, uh, in India, the first definition of terrorism came up with TADA. TADA, 1987, Terrorist and Destructive Activities Prevention Act. So here you can see we have definition of terrorism for the first time in India. And uh, we have defined or differentiated terrorism from disruptive activities. So both are to be prevented. So what is terrorism? What is disruptive activity? Disruptive activity in the sense, there may be some state uh, operations, there may be some economic operations. So some process is going to be disrupted, okay? By the act of terror, then we call it as disruptive activities. Okay, so you try to block it, you try to do something that way. Whereas in case of terrorists, uh, they involve in terror activity and uh, especially this will create a damage to large scale civilians, okay, civilian, civilian properties. So that we call it as terrorist activity and disruptive in the sense, say a uh, large scale, uh, I mean, landmines and blast, uh, I mean, uh, doing away with the uh, infrastructure, 
and so on that we call it as disruptive activities so for the first time we started defining terrorism uh, with tata okay before that we didn't have actually a definition uh, in this regard right and even today ipc doesn't have uh, uh, terrorism included rather we have other offenses club together which we have as terrorism and uh, exclusive laws were uh, enacted in india to deal with terrorism so one of the earliest act was unlawful activities prevention act the infamous uapa so even today it is uh, present and this uapa was uh, largely utilized uh, against terror activities as of now and we have uh, many amendments which have done to uh, unlawful activities prevention act and we had national securities act in 1980 which uh, brought in uh, a larger perspective of national security here uh, the freedom of uh, speech and so on so it will be regulated and uh, restrained with respect to national security nsa so this is one important act uh, which is uh, again um, with respect to internal security activities and so on so we can have under nsa tada is not uh, in force now it has been um, uh, what do you call uh, uh, repealed so way back in 1985 and 1987 it was okay and in 1990s it was uh, done away with but unfortunately after that we had some terror activities so we had a pota pota so pota was there since 2002 and later in 2006 7 we actually repealed it and it even had a sunset clause okay so sunset clause means it will be defined that the, within this particular period there will be after this a law will be enacted so now these two acts are not present whereas these two acts are there okay so in all these uh, pota uh, tada plus uh, expanded uh, version of uh, terrorist activities definition has been uh, provided okay so if you want to really go into the larger scales of definitions uh, you refer uh, second arc uh, report on combating terrorism so you have all the definitions which are there within the fold of uh, uapa tada pota and so on you can understand the meaning of it uh, in the whole sum right so just because for time constraint and uh, um, not to dwell upon much so i haven't uh, provided the definition as such but you can just refer these uh, uh, sources where you can get the entire definition okay so the definition will be a large scale definition there the definition itself goes with uh, 10 to 15 lines so you can see how elaborate that uh, that is uh, defined right but the problem is international law which doesn't have uh, this definition or un accepted uh, law doesn't have any definition which was accepted by the member states so even the un convention against terrorism uh, which wants to bring in some definitions so there are multiple aspects uh, discussed by the member countries so it is not uh, defined properly and since it was not defined properly some countries which say it is terrorism some countries doesn't say it is terrorism it is just a uh, extremist act or a violent act against certain things so this is how the the dilution of the aspect with respect to uh, anti terror activities come in okay okay now uh, when it goes into uh, what do you call the um, um, i mean your uh, terrorism in the interland so it is one of the internal security problems what we have terrorism within the country okay so what are the different types of terrorism within the country which we face right and uh, these are these can also be called as the types or categories of terrorism which uh, we actually possess or have right so in this way we have the first one ethno national terrorism okay ethno national terrorism so what does it mean as the name indicate ethno national terrorism is a violence by a subnational ethnic group so there will be some ethnic group so the ethnic group will have certain issues 
uh, face in this particular uh, society. So in order to address that issue or in order to highlight that issue, they involved in terror activities. Say, for example, some insurgent groups in northeastern India, what we have called ULPA. Okay, it's an, a good example of ethno-national terrorism, which wants to protect the Assami culture. And same way, we have the Tamil nationalist groups in uh, Sri Lanka, and also which operated as well um, in the early days in the mainland of India also. So these uh, Tamil nationalist groups, uh, like TNA or LTT and so on. So all these are examples of ethno-nationals because they want to have this ethnic Tamil population to be protected against the Sinhali aggression. So this we call it as ethno-national uh, terrorism, right? And there are some kind of religious terrorism, okay? What is religious terrorism, which is motivated by the religious imperatives? So for their religious beliefs, practices, and so on, we call them as Khalistan movement, which was popular in the um, Punjab region, uh, the Bindran Wale group. And then we had the Jigadi terror, where the uh, Islamic fundamentalists wage war against uh, non-Islamic uh, uh, civilians. So all these uh, we call as religious terrorism. Right? So, even there are terror in the name of religion, uh, Buddhist against Rohingyas. So they were targeted uh, ethnically, religiously, and multifolded, okay? So in that way. And then we also face narco-terrorism. What is narco-terrorism? Narcotics plus terror, okay? So they involve in narcotic trafficking, thereby they earn money and uh, they try to influence the policies of uh, the government through terror activities, okay? So for terror, they use narcotics, trafficking or sales, okay? So that we call it as terror, uh, terror activities which we have in this particular aspect, narco-terrorism. So India is largely affected by narco-terrorism, especially in the Western, uh, previously it was largely found in the Western zone, uh, in the northern zone, but as of now, it is more spreading into various other uh, parts, other activities also, okay? And uh, the narco-terrorism or uh, drug trafficking is one of the serious uh, menace what we are facing now, next only to, uh, uh, I mean, your uh, left-wing extremism. Uh, when Manmohan Singh was prime minister, he rightly said that uh, left-wing extremism is uh, one of the greatest threats uh, for internal security. And now, uh, more than that, it is drug trafficking and narco-terrorism, which is shaking the very fundamentals of India. That we'll see at large uh, when we talk about organized crimes later. Okay. Then comes terrorism in the interland with the ideology. So ideology based, ideology in the sense, the left ideology and the right ideology. So left-wing terrorism, right-wing terrorism. What is left-wing terrorism? Left-wing terrorism are the groups which uh, go with the communist ideology. Okay? So they go with the communist ideology. And this ideological uh, or Maoist ideology. Okay? And these ideologies are uh, working against the uh, government in power, and they try to uh, go against the ruling elite uh, through present uh, class. Okay, this present class uh, can be okay. This present class can be either um, Adivasi peasants, that is the forest peasants, or the uh, mainstream civilian peasants. Uh, what we have so largely, the tribal peasants are one of the important. Uh, uh, base for the left-wing terrorist, right? So they involve in terror, they involve in their own ideological way of attacking uh, government establishments. And these are some of the establishments, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, they attack largely the government establishments like infrastructure, telecommunication, uh, infra, critical infras. So all critical infra will be under threat. 
and they will be targeting the bureaucracy, uh, police personnel, security personnel, etc. Okay, so this is one of the most important uh, aspect of left wing terror. Then we have right wing terror. Right wing terror is something a group uh, which is fundamentalist in nature. Okay, so they are fundamentalist and radicalist. All right, and uh, they seek to maintain the status quo of the cultural aspect or the previous uh, aspect. They want to revive the cultural uh, aspect what we had before. So that we call it as a right wing terror. Okay, right wing terror is the one which is going to be one of the most important. Uh, rising problem what we face in India. Okay, so they are revivalist. They want to revive the past in the present condition and they try to uh, use terror in this particular way. Uh, even in India, we had many such terror which uh, we uh, have a uh, allege, uh, I mean, it is alleged that it is a right wing terror. And then we also face state sponsored terrorism. State-sponsored terrorism is something which external state, an external country, so they try to support terror against a particular country, right? So, for example, there may be some terror groups which are, um, um, what do you call the uh, terror groups which are supported by Pakistan in Jammu and Kashmir. The Chechenian tribes, I mean, uh, terrorists were uh, fighting against Russia. They were supported by the opponents of Russia, right? Same way, there are certain uh, group of uh, terrorist uh, or extremist population which work in other countries which are uh, supported by Russians. So likewise, we have many such uh, state-sponsored terror across the world. Okay, but the most notorious one which uh, India accuses is Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan, where uh, they become the uh, terror havens or the terror hubs in the world, right? Fine. So there is one question, is left wing similar to extremism? No, both are extremist. Left wing, both are terrorists, right? So. Um, that's the reason why we call left-wing terrorism, right-wing terrorism. Okay, both are terrorism. It's not that uh, left-wing is extremist and right-wing is moderate. Both are equally extremist. Both are equally, um, what do you call, terrorist. Okay? At least uh, in the left-wing, they have a reason uh, that uh, it is a livelihood issue where they, uh, when you solve the developmental problems, say for example, uh, previously, when we discussed left-wing terrorism, you know, so India was affected largely in 180 districts before. Now we have around only 70 districts, less than a half of it. Why? Because the developmental agenda is what we discussed before. The developmental deficits have been done away, and now we are uh, filling the gaps. So naturally, the impact of left-wing comes down because it's a livelihood issue. Whereas right-wing is something, an ideology which doesn't go with the developmental issue. It is just with the uh, the I mean the religious communal issue, okay, which is nowhere uh, necessitated for growth or development. So uh, when you see with the background, so you can see the most worst form is your right wing terror, right? Now, since it is now upcoming, it, we don't know the uh, velocity or we 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 don't know the the velocity of it. Uh, uh, like what we experienced with the right wing terror, which is existing since 1960s, right? Though uh, the right wing terror is almost uh, as old as 100 years, uh, but the thing is that the potential is now realized only for the past few decades. So that's the reason why you didn't understood the uh, wrath of it. But now we are understanding it and we are uh, finding it, uh, it may lead to a larger disaster than the left wing terror can be because it can be easily solved or it can be targeted whereas this is this is something abstract right so that's a problem so it, it creates a mindset uh, of revivalism that's a problem right 
So both are equally disastrous. And that's the reason why we call both are terror. Okay. Fine. So these are some of the different types of terrorisms uh, what we uh, experience uh, in this particular aspect, in this particular uh, form, right? Fine. Uh, in India, uh, when we talk about the state-sponsored terror or um, the other aspects, generally, uh, whatever may be the type, whether it is external, sorry, whether it is uh, state-sponsored or whether it is religious, uh, whatever may be the ideological thing, uh, we can classify them into two. One is external, another one is non-state actor. Okay, external actor a non-state actor, okay? So this is what uh, we are going to understand now. Um, this is largely, uh, you can find in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, um, where the external state actors and the non-state uh, actors are largely participating in the terror activities. So what is external state actor? External state actor means any government, okay? So any government, which directly or indirectly indulges in terrorism against a particular country or people of its own, then we call it as external state actor terror, right? A terrorism by external state actor. So state actor means the government itself directly or indirectly involves in terror against its own people or against other country, then we call it as external state actor. The role the external state actor plays is very crucial because it is a country, it is a government. So government, you know, it is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient, right? So when it is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient, the nature of support which it can provide is enormous right, for a terror activity. So starting from ideological support, it can largely go with the financial support, even military support, institutional support like what ISI or others give. The, they turn to be a safe havens and they provide intelligence uh, inputs. They even provide training at times. So in that way, you can see that uh, external uh, state or external uh, terror was there, uh, sponsored terror was there at large. Say, for example, when uh, though uh, uh, it's uh, what do you call uh, it's self indicting So it's reality that uh, even Indian government had uh, supported LTT in the beginning when it was not declared as a terror organization. But for Sri Lanka, it is a terror organization, right? So in that way, what they will say, India had sponsored LTTE, which is a terrorist in our, in our country. We provided them with intelligence input, uh, training, financial input, and so on. Officially, they were even supports, which were provided. Uh, LTTE chief Prabhagran had met uh, Rajiv Gandhi, right? Uh, here, uh, the chief ministers like uh, Kalangar Karananati, um, I mean, uh, MGR had uh, supported and met them in person. So, though at that time it was not wrong in India because it, uh, LGT was not a terror organization or other organizations were not declared as terror organizations at that time. But later after 1990s when they were declared as a terror organization by India, naturally all these supports have been done away with, right? at least on the direct uh, uh, means, right? Uh, or at least on the state uh, means. So in that way, uh, even India had uh, uh, involved in that, but it was not actually uh, state-sponsored a terror because for India, it was not a terror organization at that time. Uh, but in Pakistan, international terrorists have been supported. Say, for example, when we had... Uh, terror organizations declared as international terrorists, they were supported. But there are certain activities when international terrorists have been declared, they were uh, vetoed by countries like China and so on. So 
uh, it clearly shows that there are terror people who are supporting. And India accepted that it is a terrorist organization when these people involved in terror activities, right? Uh, by killing people and so on. So uh, that's a difference. So how India supported a cause and India uh, withdrew its support when it is uh, felt that it is not right to um, have this particular organization growing because it's going terror. So that's a logic, uh, what India had it in back of mind. So when India supported LTT and others, it was not only LTT and the other organizations, there were other 13 organizations today. We were supporting the cause of the people, right? When the same organizations convert themselves, we chucked off LTT, but we uh, supported other organizations which part, took part in the political systems and so on. But Pakistan doesn't do that. Okay, so the real the real motive uh, of Pakistan is to uh, dismember India. Whereas the real uh, idea of uh, India was not to dismember Sri Lanka. The idea was to uh, have an inclusive Sri Lanka where Tamil uh, ethnic population will also get their due respect and uh, status. So there are differences. So why I'm saying the both the sides. And I also uh, mentioned that it is self-intimidating because in interview, they may say uh, that India also involved in uh, external uh, state-sponsored terrorism, but we don't call it as because this is the difference what it is, okay? So when, when a particular state supports terror organization, what happens or uh, what the implications? Actually, when terror is being supported, it is taken up as a foreign policy tool or an instrument. When if Pakistan really wants to do something with India and uh, India is not budging to something, they involve terror. Then as a part of uh, terror talk, they try to involve in certain talks and they, they try to get certain things done. So now terrorism became one of the instruments of foreign policy, which we can't accept, right? Many, it happens, say for example, against India, we have some organizations like Jaish e Mohammed and Lakshad e Taiba, and against Afghanistan, they have Al Qaeda and Taliban. And against uh, Pakistan, they have Takarik e Taliban Pakistan. So, likewise, each country tries to put, uh, put the against or check against each other with terror and uh, making them pawns. Uh, pulling the springs when things have to be under control, which cannot happen and which would happen. Right? Another thing is when these uh, state actors act as supporters of terrorism, one of the major problem what they face is the emergence of a deep state. What is this deep state? In Pakistan, you can find a deep state. Why in Pakistan the terror organizations couldn't uh, be controlled? Say, for example, even in the last session, um, one of uh, them um, uh, asked why Pakistan couldn't uh, control terror or they are subject to terrorism. Because even when the Pakistan government genuinely wants to reduce terror activities, uh, it is the state of affairs that they are into the deep state. What is deep state? Deep state means there are population within the government which is very, very powerful, okay? Uh, the personalities, the bureaucrats, the military officials who are within the uh, government, who hold the powerful positions, they run the influencing campaign, uh, nurturing the radical groups. And they nurture the radical groups as a strategic asset. So that we call it as deep state. Deep state means it is a body of influencers from within the government who are very powerful and they try to nurture the radical groups as a strategic assets. So what happens even when the state wants to do away with that, the state elements will act as a very high supportive tool for nurturing these radical groups. So naturally you cannot do away with that. Okay. So that's a problem what it happens to be. This is how the problem uh, is well, uh, well in this particular case. Yeah. Okay. So who are the non-state actors? Non-state actors means it may be individual or a group uh, who are not directly or indirectly linked to the government. 
so you can say it is directly not linked but uh, there may be indirect contact uh, which we cannot establish okay so, but uh, in generally a non state actor means any individual or a group or organization which is not associated or financed by the government then we call it as non state actors right and uh, they have some proxy element uh, say for example um, isbul mujahideen jaish e mohammed is a proxy organization it will be posing itself as a political organization but it will actually campaign for terror activities uh, in the state okay so that is how uh, it will be clear yeah. then as far as features are concerned the non state actors will organize cartels okay the non state actors will organize cartels so there may be uh, different networks of uh, terror organizations you can see hakani network the most popular network a powerful network in afghanistan so it is a group of network of the terror net okay so there will be different groups so lakshari taiba al qaeda um what you call tagariya pakistan and so on there are many such organizations and uh, there will be one organization which forms a network of these organizations like akani so they will have some cartels right then they involve in liberation movements so in the name of liberation in the name of uh, separatism in the name of uh, so and so they try to organize some uh, religious uh, i mean uh, popular people involved in liberation movements and they have religious and ideological organizations to influence people okay influencers in influence the people and they have self defense militia and this militia will be armed militia they they involve in terror activities they involve in organized crimes for money and they establish networks to organize terror okay so this is how the feature of a non state actor will be. so they involve in cartels thereby they involve in popular liberation movements for that they try to bring in the influencers through religious and ideological organizations and then they influence the uh, uh, people by militia organize crimes for raising funds and uh, establish network what we call the terror networks clear yeah? so this is how it happens and the modus operandi of these people will be the bleed with thousand cuts what is this when india uh, couldn't be won by the war in uh, until 1971 uh, pakistan tried much but it was in vain so what happened um, zia ul haq so uh, former president he said we cannot wage a war against india and win but we can bleed india with thousand cuts that means when india is there try to attack india in various parts isolatedly so try to wound india bleed india bleed india to death so that is how they try to do it is not an outright war it is a uh, isolated attacks which happens in india thereby you will cut the tourism you will cut the economy likewise locally terrorizing people and so so to bleed india with a thousand cuts they follow lone wolf attacks jihadi terror which we had discussed before. same way they also involve in counterfeiting currency what we have uh, counterfeiting currency called uh, uh, the rupee uh, factor they uh, as per rbi 1600 crores where uh, the counterfeit currency which happened to be in india in 2000 uh 18 19 right i mean 16 17 at that time so that is during the demonetization time and uh, arms and ammunition struggling uh, sorry smuggling so this particular arms and ammunition smuggling is one important aspect where they earn money as well as they involve in terror activities from across border so across border they try to do it. then they finance terror that we will see later uh islamic fundamentalism communalism all these will form the ideological influence 
uh, what they can have, right? So this is what we have on part of India uh, with respect to terror activities, how the terror activities happen uh, in this particular case. Yeah. So these are different forms of terror, different classifications of terror, what India faces and how the nature of terrorism is. Now, the changing phase of terror. So what is the changing phase of terrorism we have? The changing phases of terrorism is can be traced through their operations, through their targets, through their alliance, through their activities, through their tactics, through their weapons. In all these six previous older methods and the new methods can be traced. Say, for example, you can see previously terror havens were there. And from that terror hubs, the terror population will be there. Say, for example, uh, if India is there, and uh, say, for example, if India is there, the terror hub was just 80 kilometers away from India in Afghanistan, in Mangala Dam. Okay. There, the training camps will be there across Jhelum River and so on. So when you just look into these terror hubs and monitor these terror hubs, you can know so how many terrorists are getting trained, how many are dispatched. So we can get input. Okay, the terror, uh, training camps are over. So infiltrations will start now and we can have some idea. Whereas now, these safe havens are not in a particular area. They are now globalized. So the international terrorism has gone into in such a way that you can't even find the safe havens. So it is highly distributed across the globe. So it need not be near to you, but the safe havens will exist across the globe. So from hub, now they have grown up internationally. So their links are international and they hire people from international region. Okay? So that's a, one important uh, change. Uh, in operations. The second important is target. Previously, the terror people, uh, they target either head of the states, okay, or they try to uh, have some uh, military heads, okay, so the chief of armed staffs and so on. So uh, killing a captain, killing a major, killing a general, killing a minister, killing a prime minister, targeting the president. So likewise, the regicide was there. Okay? Whereas now, it is genocide. That is large-scale civilian attack. So mass death. Okay, So mass civilian attack, uh, uh, death caused by people, I mean, a terrorist on people at large, and those people will be common men. Okay? So the converting the people anger against the government through killing people. Say in Mumbai terror, you can see uh, more than 300 people died just because of uh, a couple of uh, uh, people, uh, that is uh, 10 people, handful of people, uh, they could cause a assault of around 300 people, right? So hue and cry happens. So regicide to genocide. So previously they targeted prime ministers of India, ministers and so on. Now they target civilian population. And previously, they had some common goals. So when they had some targets, they had some common goals, like political goals, um, establishing caliphate, establishing uh, government of Islam, uh, Islamic states, and so on. Whereas now it is not in this way. Now what happens, they try to have a large-scale uh, uh, idea with a single issue, single point, say, liberation of German engagement. That's all. That's the only thing. Okay, so likewise, a single, single factor, a single issue now becomes a terror target, not the entire, uh, what do you call the entire hub, okay, the, I mean, the entire target or entire political objective is not there, only specific targets are there. And even there are terrorist organizations with specific targets, right? And then alliances. Previously, they were all individual groups, okay? like uh, Al-Qaeda separately, Lakshmi Taiba separately, and so on. 
whereas then they converted into networks okay now network of networks okay so previously they were all individual okay and they had some networks formed clear now all these networks are interconnected so network of networks that is what it is happening so an al qaeda can have a link with ltd ltd link with a left wing terror left wing terror having link with uh, insurgents in uh, the resulfa and so on so likewise the individual groups into networks and network or networks it happens clear then as far as weapons are concerned the weapons definitely has changed from traditional bombs to guns now we have weapons of mass destruction okay wmd weapons of mass destruction especially more than the nuclear terrorism chemical and biological terrorism is a very major threat because it is easy for terrorists to access the uh, chemical and biological terror i mean uh, weapons than the nuclear okay but still uh, the weapons are changing tactics are changing previously aircraft was hijacked to cause terror now digital spoofing of air traffic control system is enough previously i need to enter at a uh, uh, airport get into the aircraft uh, hijack the plane now just sitting in canada sitting in china sitting in russia sitting in us sitting in africa i can just digitally spoof the atc command thereby when aircraft uh, takes off or uh, lands i can crash it okay i can give some wrong signals to crash it so in that way uh, tactics are changing from lone wolf hybrid militancy is there we will discuss hybrid militancy how it happens okay so a civilian converting himself into a terrorist and then back to civilian form hybrid militancy and also hybrid warfare which we saw all things put together organizational terrorist to private terrorist this is another important factor first the terrorists come from some organization say let ulfa and so on but now there are private terrorists there are group of individuals without any organization without any stuff fundamentals they just attack and they die okay so these are some changing phases of terrorism what we have at large uh, in this particular case in this particular aspect clear yeah? fine then another point is uh, from political terrorism uh, it went on for economic terrorism targeting economic aspects that is political means leaders regicide and so on and then they targeted uh, economic terrorism which targeted economic units so fall in growth rate fall in stock market so try to uh, have a volatility in economy and so on. then they went on for urban terrorism targeting urban migrants urban land where uh, multiple targets in urban areas like mumbai the best example is mumbai attack okay so mumbai terror economic terrorism uh, they will attack some uh, economic areas like uh, hyderabad bangalore mumbai surat okay so some economic hubs will be targeted uh, thereby the business investments will be affected okay tourism will be affected then previously we had large amount of cross border terrorism whereas now infiltration has came uh, comes down but the incidence of interland terrorism uh, increases that is hiring of locals so local terrorism increases you need not infiltrate people from pakistan to india now there are people who are hiring indians to fight against india itself so that's the most worst part of it then the jihadi militancy now converted into hybrid militants previously they will declare themselves jihadist post the papers with their photos and so on and they will claim that in the name of the lord i am fighting against a particular country now it's all silent no photos no poses no whatsapp nothing uh, invisible this is the worst form of uh, militancy what we face now in jammu and kashmir Uh, at present it's now popular after 2020 uh, 
uh, especially after the ab uh, abolition of uh, 370. We'll see that in detail when we talk about prosperity. Okay. Okay. So these are some of the changing phases of terrorism. And uh, some new forms of terrorism have emerged. What are they? Say, for example, we call it as fourth generation warfare. So what is fourth generation warfare? We call it as 4GW, okay, 4G warfare, fourth generation warfare. So generally we have five generations of warfare. It is uh, not as of now perceived or experienced, but just an expectation. Uh, first generation warfare is a, a line and column tactics. That is, there will be having the lines with the uh, various hierarchies and various uh, formations, the ancient and medieval times. We had the formal battlefield, uh, different types of formations, strategies they use with uh, infantry, cavalrys, etc. Clear? So that we call this first generation warfare. Second generation warfare, they used uh, military uh, with artillery fire, that is gunpowder and guns. In the late, uh, late uh, medieval times, they started using artilleries. So instead of uh, swords uh, and other aspects, they started using hand guns, gunpowder, etc. Third generation warfare is the one which used uh, high speed uh, delivery mechanism, that is missiles. Okay, generally, this is the technology what we call it as missile because these gunpowder and uh, the nuclear power are going to be uh, having delivery mechanisms. You need not carry. So that will be delivered by some mechanism that we call it as missile. So high speed stealth uh, without uh, uh, being sensed, it will be moving. Surprise attack will be there. Infiltration will be there. So all these things can happen. And uh, in the fourth generation warfare, blurring of lines will be there between war, politics, combatants and civilians the non-state actor and against the state. Okay, So all these will work. Whereas in fifth generation, it is information and perception. You need not fight. You create an information uh, warfare that we will see now. So information will create uh, agitations. So you can know that how it can happen. Uh, this agitations uh, can happen at large due to false uh, messages. So you can you see in Tamil Nadu, we had some organized mob activity through WhatsApp. So through information, through perception that the government doesn't do anything. The government is going to do something. There will be some perception. Through perception, there will be some intimidation to do uh, uh, some uh, mischief, right? So perception information game is going to be the one warfare. You try to emotionally kindle people and try to do it. Right? So that we call it as the fifth generation warfare. Right? So as far as fourth generation warfare, what are the features? The fourth generation warfare, we call this as uh, already in the roots of the world, uh, Cold War. Because what you say in fourth uh, generation warfare, uh, the lines are blurring. Right? Same way in Cold War, on the battlefield, you won't fight, okay? But in all fields, you will fight. Say, for example, you may fight in Olympics. You may fight in politics. You may fight in social, in all sense, economy, growth rate. In all sense, you try to fight. That we call it as a Cold War, right? So it's a complex and long-term war because it's a war of perceptions. And uh, it is a war with people uh, psychologically. And they don't have any uh, defined battlefield. It's a non-linear. So no defined battlefields or fronts. And they have a very strong cultural attack, OK? So cultural attack in the sense, they will demean the culture. They try to pose that the culture is not real. Uh, 
their culture is more real so opponent culture is not real and so on and it lacks hierarchy because it has a group of people who involved in various forms or intensity of this particular perception so they have different whatsapp group they will try to uh, create something which you want to do it uh, which you like first they will supply information which you like and then slowly your brain will be uh, uh, groomed by them and then they will send the information which you believe that that is right so it is highly flexible patient system without any defined battlefield or fronts and there will be more cultural scenario in this way and this fourth generation warfare it's even uh, very very dangerous because it's a perception change and uh, bringing back the perception to reality is very difficult that is de-radicalization is very difficult process right and uh, you can see that they are highly decentralized and transnational in base decentralized in the sense they'll be in operating in very small groups because it's all a soft power right you are going to use more of soft power so very highly decentralized group will be there and it will be a low intensity conflict because it is not going to happen in the battlefield highly decentralized forces uh, non combatants okay non combatants will be targeted and there will be some tactical dynam dynamas for the civilians non combatants means civilians civilians will have some dilemma what to believe what not to believe and uh, the fourth generation warfare will use a network of communication effectively and after that they will use insurgency tactics like uh, uh, subversions genocide terrorism guerrilla attacks at a small scale in a local area okay and that's the reason you can find the private terrorist are hired and used it so this is how the entire aspects come in clear and this is how the fourth generation warfare feature is but sometime what they say this is actually not real say uh, you are just creating a uh, i mean uh, nothing out of i mean something out of nothing why because there is nothing new in um, fourth generation warfare that's a criticism what they have because the goal of the second generation warfare is survival you need to uh, when the terrorist organization doesn't have the survival uh, reason they involve in the fourth generation warfare by by corrupting the mind of the people right so it is not the new thing which is happening it is just repackaging what it happened way back in the world war that is what they say this is traditionally done by the insurgent people against the state the same thing is done by the insurgents right so fourth generation warfare or simply insurgencies they are just blending different forms of terrorism and not a new by itself so this is one criticism what we have in this regard all right but anyway the fourth generation warfare is now the talk of the town even nsa in his meeting uh, in various forms uh, especially in the national maritime uh, coordinator meeting so he talked about uh, fourth generation warfare where india has to uh, bring in but there are criticisms that it is already there and it is we are experiencing just it's just a repackaging and giving it a new name that's all but anyway this is the fourth generation warfare what we have and then we come to the last part the of the discussion the terror financing so what is terror financing funding the terrorism that's a basic uh, uh, aspect of terror financing but terror financing according to faef that is financial action task force formed by g20 they say terror financing is required because the terrorist organization has to undergo terror activities for which they need money they need to function as an organization they need money they need to provide technical necessities by arms ammunition so they need money at least manufacture something they need money they need to spread their ideology influence people we they need soft power so they need money so they try to depend on funding or financing so terrorist organization require money for all these four functions but how they source it they largely source from illegal activities 
okay from low scale to high scale that we'll see that is organized crime they involve in various forms of illicit goods services intrusion into the government and business they try to extort money and they try to get illegal uh, money right or else they get money from some members of the organization say there can be organization genuinely operating in a country and they can supply funds okay say there may be some orphanage there may be some religious institution so they get uh, money from the people a part of money can be supplied to the other stalls then abuse of non profit organization whereby the terrorist organization will create a non profit organization uh, in some good aspects but entirely it will abuse that particular law and uh, use the terror funding or uh, use it as terror funding and that's the reason why we have foreign contribution regulation act fcra and we try to have various uh, uh, auditing and other aspects from where you get money what you are going to give where you have spent so everything is audited okay so abuse of non profit organization then levering taxes and exploiting natural resources say for example islamic state of daesh daesh is nothing but isis so they take control of a particular region they uh, try to tax the people of that region they try to exploit the natural resource sell it say for example cultural terrorism where they try to sell the cultural icons idols and so on to international market black market and get money and they finance the terror organization that is how they exploit natural resource cultural resource everything hunt animals pouch animals sell it in the black market get money then exploiting a, a stock exchange when mk narayanan was nsa he highlighted that ltt was using indian stock market boom to supply its funding because they have invested so for that reason even in sebi we call it as pn participatory notes so this participatory notes regulations were put in place and we started to implement know your customer norms stringently so that the stock market cannot be exploited state sponsoring state itself sponsoring so all these are different forms of terror financing uh, through legal and illegal means they try to get it right so how they actually find how they move money from one area to another area they use some financial market channels like stock market and so on money remittances uh, legal and illegal unregulated channels we call it as cash couriers money laundering hawala okay all these we will see when we talk about money laundering in detail more. okay so how these channels are utilized what are the methods they use what is surfing and so on everything we will uh, learn and to do away with the terror financing what we try to have is we have some measures taken up and uh, we have some measures against terror finance and this terror financing unlawful activities prevention act terror financing is declared as a serious criminal offence and financial intelligence unit take a note of all financial transactions which are heavy they india is a member in fatf financial action task force where we try to curb the money laundering financing terror etc improving safety features of uh, currencies so that uh, um, counterfeiting is difficult ban on cryptocurrency cryptocurrency is one of the major source of uh, terror because it is uh, invisible uh, it cannot be traceable uh, it is easy and it is not regulated so banning on cryptocurrencies stable currencies etc then pmla prevention of money laundering act okay so uh, prevention of money laundering act was uh, passed in 2002 and it came into existence in 2005 and then special combating finance financing of terrorism cells are there so there are many such activities which happen in this particular aspect where we had this terror financing so terror financing will deal it with uh, at large with the respect to money laundering and different types of terror financing how they use the channels etc tomorrow okay so with this uh, we complete the terror and uh, different types of terror financing what we have okay so tomorrow we will have 
the larger aspect of terror financing. Thank you.